Welcome to the National Women's Fitness Academy podcast. We're here to talk about women's health, female hormones, body image, and all things health and fitness. Hello, girls, and welcome to another episode of the Women's Fitness Academy's podcast. I'm your host, C, one of the WFA's educators and a women's online coach. Today, I've got jo- um, Dr. Joanna with me. Thank you so much for um, joining me. And I'm so glad that we're able to schedule this time, especially with, you know, this crazy, busy time of year, you know, leading into um, the festive season. And I actually cannot wait for today's chat regarding all women's health, you know, probably a little bit about hormones, mostly about health, um, in, you know, encouraging women to live their lives with more joy and um, less pain. So before we jump in, I want to let our listeners know that Dr. Joanna is a Chinese medicine practitioner, but she's also a mother. And as she says, she's also a human who loves reading, who loves um, hula hooping, which I think is so freaking cool because we need to add, address a little bit more joy into our lives. And this is what she does. She dedicates her life pretty much to help other people to live with less pain and more joy. So Joanna, thank you for being here with me. Thank you for having me. What a fabulous introduction. (laughs) Glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked it. (laughs) Um, So before we actually started recording, Joanna and I were just like, you know, chit-chatting. And she has actually shared a little bit of her, you know, health challenges over the years, which we're like, actually, I'm wanting us to dive a little bit deeper into it probably now, just so we have a better understanding of, you know, what are the things that were challenging at a time for you in the past or, you know, what's happening on right now for you? And what are some of the methods that you took upon yourself to get yourself better? So I think. You were talking, you asked me a little bit about what kind of led me to this this work and that's when I got all Freudian on you and talked about my uh, my parents' journey. So both my parents had cancer from quite an early age. I think I was, I'm trying to think what it was. It would have been 1989, I think. So I would have been eight years old and that's when my mum first got cancer. So mum's had three rounds of breast cancer with quite large gaps in between. Um, her last... Her last cancer incidence was my eldest, uh, my youngest daughter is six now and she was about one at the time, so five years ago. And then my dad also, when I was uh, 10, I think, around that, he was diagnosed with uh, quite aggressive brain cancer. And he was given six months to live and he managed to do another 19 years. He had five brain tumors removed over that time, but he passed away when he was 65. So, you know, I watched from an early age people who – were living their life under the shadow of a potentially fatal diagnosis. And I and I I learnt that your health is something that you should never take for granted. So um, you know, based on all of that, I made the obvious choice and decided to study business when I graduated, <laughs> which was not really me. There were a number of reasons why I made that decision, none of them good. But you know, when you're 16 years old, you yeah. don't know you don't know very much about much, let alone what you want to do with the rest of your life. So um, I went and I, I actually studied a marketing degree and I hated it and then managed to hate every single job that I had after that, unsurprisingly. And, you know, that created a lot of stress in my life and I was um, trying to avoid facing the issues and, you know, doing the things that we do in our 20s as well, like going out and partying and staying out late. And And I just was not feeling good myself at that stage I had a little dip into some mental health stuff I don't think I ever suffered really full-on depression but I certainly went through some times where I just didn't want to get out of bed you know we all have depressive times in our life whether or not it's actual depression um and yeah I I kind of had an epiphany I went on a holiday to Fiji Fiji is one of my very happy places because that's where I had an epiphany that I was like this is not what I should be doing with my life and I came back from that holiday and the universe, I think, you know, gave me a very clear sign because the week that I got back, I actually got fired from my job <laughs> and uh, they, they paid me out because the work environment had been uh, challenging. I'll just say that they actually paid me out like 
six months, I think it was. So when you add it up, uh, I had like entitlements and then they, they pay, I think they paid me out an additional three months. So I took a minute and I went back to university to study to become a naturopath. And then, um, as I was doing my studies, I had to write a paper on one of the other subjects that was offered at the college. And I chose Chinese medicine and it was like, it was like a homecoming, you know, it was just, I was just like, this is it. This is, this is what I want to do. And so I transferred my major. I was at university for a very long time, uh, but I transferred over and, you know, as they say, the rest is history. So that I think was kind of, you know, my background laid the foundations for me to ultimately wind up in some form of healthcare. And in terms of personal challenges where I can understand, I think you're re- referring to a spot on my website where I talk about when you're dealing with a chronic health problem and it just feels like you're never going to get out from under it and you feel like your body's broken and you can't understand you know, why it's happening. I had um, a journey semi-recently with recurrent UTIs and I was, I'd, I'd had a few in the past. You know, some women are not necessarily susceptible. I do know women that have never had one, but the stats on the number of women who will get a UTI is pretty high. Um, and for some people it can become chronic. And I'd had, I'd had a, a patch in the past of chronic UTIs actually. I'm trying, it was a long time ago. So I'm trying to think how I resolved that. I can't really remember. I think in the end, that was when, was around the time when I was making the decision actually to transfer to Chinese medicine because I had been working with a naturopath and then I started working with an acupuncturist and a China. Yeah. That, I think that's, I think it was the same time. So that's quite interesting now that I cast my mind back. But yes, more recently, I, um, I was getting a UTI almost one a month, you know, and it had gone on for about, 18 months. I think I'd had a break in the middle. Maybe I had like three or four months where I had a clear run. And then I just started getting like one a month. And that sent me off on the path of um, learning more about the urogenital microbiome. But yeah, during that time, it was, it was really, it was really difficult. It was really stressful. And um, yeah, I've kind of answered your question in a very long roundabout sort of a way, but. (laughs) I love it. It's so good. Um, it's so like back to that first point, how you mentioned that you, you know, you did business at uni and then you like went on holiday, came back and got fired and then went into the naturopath, um, you know, side of things. I think everything happens for a reason, even though we may not be aware of it, but like I very, I can relate to that so well because when I finished uni, I was just, um, school, I was like, I don't know what I want to do. So I ended up doing arts and photography. I was like, yeah, I'm going to be the greatest photographer. But once I finished it, after a few years, I was like, I don't want to be a photographer anymore. Like, so I ended up changing completely and got into the health industry. So I think something, you know, like you want to attract yourself to something that lights you up. And I think from, you know, the sense that I'm getting from yourself, you know, from the challenges that you've had, it was the right path for you to go into naturopath and Chinese medicine and back to um the UTIs I think this is a like this would be a really cool conversation for us to you know dive a little bit deeper to make our listeners understand why this happens and what's the connection in terms of like the vaginal microbiome because you know like you and I may know a little bit about this but maybe our audience is just like what is a UTI how do I fix this? What what red flags do I need to look for to avoid, um, you know, getting them on a regular basis? Yeah, so I think anyone who's ever had, uh, you know, UTIs will have been told the kind of stock standard, wear cotton underwear, pee after sex, and when you go to the toilet, wipe front to back, right? <laughs> but I can tell you every single person who is dealing with a recurrent UTI is doing all of those things and more. And it's not helping. So in a percentage of people, uh, you know, it's, it's very possible. We used to think the mechanism of a UTI was because the urethra is in close proximity to the anus, that there's the possibility for bacteria from the stools to make their way and the colon to make their way into the urethral tract and then cause an infection. And the, the kind of most common bacteria that's labeled as the cause of that is E. coli. Mm-hmm. So that's why all of those other, those previous recommendations are given to people. Um, and, you know, when, when you have sexual intercourse, that's an, 
act that's going to increase the likelihood of transference. Uh, wearing G-strings is another one because the G-string is kind of like a little bacterial superhighway between the anus and the urethra. So um, that was how we sort of understood the mechanism previously. But what we're finding out now is that it's not in, in some people, it's that simple. And that happens. They go to the doctor, they get a short script for antibiotics, one and done, end of. But for a large number of people, that's not the case. And so that's when we have to look a little bit deeper and see what might be going on um, in, a, in a broader sense with the, that whole urogenital area. Mm, yeah, so fascinating. Like, to be honest, I didn't even know the fact about the G-string. That's, yeah, that's interesting. And probably the majority of women wear G-strings these days as well. Yeah, although I think probably less than in the late 90s, early 2000s. <laughs> I feel like a lot of women have just decided that a bunch of stuff that was done back then, it's not comfortable. Fuck it. It's not comfortable. Oh, can I say? Yes, you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think we're like high heels. No, they're just painful. <laughs> yeah, so true. Oh my god, high heels are so overrated these days. I used to run for the tram in them, you know. Where and now I can't even look at them without getting sore hips. <laughs> yeah, I look and I'm like, oh, how long do I need to wear these on for? Yeah, these days I wear like the Vivo barefoot shoes. Like oh you my can god, get I even. I live in my Vivos. Live in them. Yeah, seriously. So do I. So do I. And I think that's how you know as well. I mean, you look like you're a bit younger than I am but I was saying to my partner the other day that the moment that you know you're old is when you will gleefully exchange looking good for being comfortable or being warm <laughs> like <laughs> I'll tuck my t-shirt into my tracksuit pants I don't care <laughs> comfortable you know I love it with um regarding the UTIs is the cranberry juice still a a myth that goes around or is it like factual what's happening with that it so it is and it isn't so the it the compound within the cranberry that is useful uh yes that is useful it basically creates kind of like a teflon coating on on the bladder and urethra so that the bacteria can't adhere so it's definitely useful but again it's the, the mechanism of delivery with cranberry juice it's often sweetened you know and depending on what's going on sugar could exacerbate the problem mm-hmm. um and it it may provide some temporary relief or it may be useful overall in trying to treat what's going on, but you really would need to be drinking the unsweetened cranberry juice. And if anyone's ever had that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's not great. Um, there are some other supplements uh, and interventions that are probably that I would put before that, although there is there's a supplement called Allura, Allura Flautis, I think, and that's um, got the – the component within cranberry that is beneficial and so you can take that as a supplement as opposed to drinking the cranberry juice yeah okay cool that's good to know and in terms of like you know chinese herbal medicine when we're looking at utis is there something specific that you would recommend or do with the clients to help them you know heal that challenge so it's really interesting with um treating utis i did kind of fall back to my naturopathic roots for two reasons one I found a mentor. Uh, her name is Moira. I'm thinking of her surname. It's a double barrel. Bradfield um, Stridum, I think, is her, her. We can link to the show notes. So if anyone is interested in learning more about it, uh, she's my mentor. And for any practitioners who are listening, she has courses that you can do. And she's a naturopath, but she's also studied TCM. So we had a lot of fun, um, or I had a lot of fun working with her. Um, and the other reason why I like the approach of falling back to the naturopath approach is because a lot of the time a UTI is just going to sneak up on you out of nowhere. You're going to be on holiday, having heaps of hotel sex, you know, <laughs> and drinking more alcohol, eating, you know, sugar or whatever. So at that point, you can't go to your acupuncturist and get your herbal formula made up and, you know, you're, you're stuck and UTIs can be very painful for some people. So I like to be able to provide interventions that people can get their hands on really easily from, you know, chemists and pharmacies, uh, online supplement, you know, like I heard that sort of thing. So, however, Chinese medicine is fantastic for UTIs. Acupuncture can really help reduce the pain, the acute pain, and Chinese herbs are amazing. So there's a typical formula that most people would know called um, 
Bajan Sun, which is uh, Bajan Sun, Bajan Tan. This is the problem with having formulas in a language. You have to remember them all. Uh, I think it's Bajan <laughs> Dozens Sun, of- not Bajan Tan. <laughs> Uh, however, it's not Chinese medicine, and this, I guess, is a good foray into a little bit about Chinese medicine. It's not as simple as you have a UTI, so we're going to give you these herbs. Uh, the beauty of Chinese medicine lies in the fact that we're going to look at the person in front of us and we're going to say, okay, why do you have a UTI? What is causing that UTI in you? And one person, we might say, well, it's because you have heart fire. So the Chinese medicine looks at the body in terms of all the, the, the vital organs and channels and um, also the elements, you know, fire and water and wood and earth. So one person may have what we consider heart fire. Another person may have damp heat, you know, coming from the digestive system. And interestingly, when they've done studies where they've cultured the bacteria in different women with UCIs, they find that the women who have uh, different Chinese medicine diagnoses actually grow different bacteria in their cultures. So I find that really, really interesting um, that, yes, we can can divide people into different categories and science is kind of catching up and being like, well, there is validity to that. So, yeah, you can use herbs for treating a UTI most definitely, uh, short-term and long-term, but you would tailor the formula to that individual. Yeah, I love that. Um, I've been dabbling a little bit into Chinese medicine myself, not to to, um, to learn it, but like I do see a acupuncturist, and every so often when there's certain things happening with life, she'll recommend like a certain formula or like a certain tea, and it's just so fascinating because like I don't know about our listeners, but I'm the type of person if I get something, I want to learn more about it and understand like the the meaning behind it, and I know. There's so much um, information out there about um, Chinese herbal medicine, but also acupuncture. And I know, like, I'm, this is off topic, but like, acupuncture is not just, um, you know, looking at certain like pain points and, like you said, like looking at the organs and certain like effective um, like treatments for it. But I've also found that with acupuncture there's a cosmetic range for it as well yeah so i've i've done the training for cosmetic acupuncture it's amazing yeah. uh yes so the the mechanism of are you you're asking about the mechanism of action for cosmetic acupuncture yeah, yeah. you want to know a little bit more how it works so uh the Cosmetic acupuncture involves needling the face but also doing a constitutional diagnosis on the person. So if someone comes in and we there's such a thing in Chinese medicine as face reading. So we look at, you know, where the lines are developing and, so, you know, do we have discoloration on the face in certain areas? Is there shadowing? Dark circles under the eyes will tell us something. Is the skin crepey? Is the skin, does it have like a sallow tint, a yellow tint, or is there a lot of redness? So this is all information that's going to help us figure out what's going on for that person constitutionally. And then we'll ask questions. We ask a lot of questions in Chinese medicine. Talk a lot, talk a lot about poo. Yeah. yeah <laughs> but we like ask a lot of questions. We love poo talk. It's, uh, it's a very, very good diagnostic, uh, the state of the stool. Um, but we'll also look at the tongue, mm. feel the pulse, and then we will do a constitutional treatment. So we use acupuncture points in the body to support the person's um, general health, specific general health. And then we'll go to the face and use um, acupuncture points and specific needling techniques, gua sha, uh, dermal rolling as well on the face. And there's a couple of mechanisms of action there. One is that you're creating sort of the most simple explanation is you're creating micro trauma. So by putting very, very fine needles into the, into the face, you're creating a little bit of damage and the body's like, oh, I better go and fix that up. And as a consequence, you stimulate your body's own um, production of collagen and elastin. But also people hold a lot of tension in their face. So you're releasing muscle groups as well, which increases blood flow. And then there is that certain je ne sais quoi about acupuncture where it, it works in ways that we don't quite fully understand yet as well. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I remember the first time I uh, got co- cosmetic um, acupuncture, I think I got it underneath my eyes and like my top lip 
and you like I didn't notice a change straight away but like you said our body's very smart it's going to after putting some trauma into your into your face it's going to want to repair it and I felt those certain like pressure points like wanting to to repair and you know what to be honest like the collagen of my face right now has improved um dramatically from doing those treatments so yeah it's so fascinating regarding you know acupuncture and i love the um that you mentioned how you look on the tongue i think the tongue is really cool so you know when you see a client with a tongue with um let's say what's the what, what's the common thing that you would see on a client's tongue well it's not so much what's common that you see, it's what you're looking for. So you're looking at the shape of the tongue body. Uh, you're looking for whether there are any indentations on the tongue. Are there any cracks on the tongue? What is the color of the tongue? The color of the tongue body, the color of the tongue coating. Is there a coating? Is there a coating only in certain areas? So all of this information you're kind of looking at to form a picture of what's happening um, in the person. So the shape of the tongue will tell you things about various organ systems. If there's indentations, a lot of people, so if you stick your tongue out and look in the mirror and you sort of, there's a technique to poking your tongue out. You don't want to poke it out really far and make it taut because the tongue is just a muscle, right? You want to poke it out far enough that you can see it, but so it's still sort of relaxed. But if you have indentations in the sides of the tongue, that is quite common. Uh, We call it teeth marking. It's not really that cryptic. Um, And that will tell us that maybe there's something going on with fluid metabolism and the digestive system because the tongue is swollen and pushing against the teeth. So yeah, there's there's if the if the tongue is red, then we're looking for signs of heat in the body. Is it full heat, so an excess of heat, or is it what we call a deficient heat, meaning there's not enough water, there's not enough yin aspect in the body to keep the yang aspect, the fire in check. And so you have what we call deficient fire going on. So yeah, again, there's Lots of different things that we're looking for specific to that individual. That's so interesting. So if someone had like a crack in the in their tongue, like in the middle, what would that mean? It's usually an imbalance in the digestive system. Again, if it runs all the way to the tip, then we're going to start looking at the heart organ as well. And sometimes we're talking about the physical organ in Chinese medicine, but often we're talking about the, the energy. It sounds a bit hippie woo-woo, but we're talking about the energetics of that organ. So if, um, you know, I saw a heart crack in the tongue. I would start questioning around family history of heart heart disease or heart issues. And failing that, then we start looking to, okay, well, do you yourself suffer palpitations, palpitations on exertion? Do you have anxiety? Do you have trouble sleeping, insomnia? So we're looking less about physical heart function and then more about the energetics of the, the heart and the heart channel in the body. That's so interesting because I have a crack in my tongue. That's why I was asking you. I was just like, hmm, that's interesting. And I do have a um, a history of having a heart murmur. There you go. Mm. Uh, yeah, that is so fascinating. I love that. So when you're incorporating this into, you know, like seeing, seeing clients, let's say, you know, the, the girls that are listening to this podcast are mainly involved in, you know, training, health and nutrition side of things. What are... I guess, you know, my question is like, what are some common factors that you see in terms of, you know, fit people um, that are, you know, the the challenges that they're facing that you see? Less is more baby (laughs) would be if I had to sum it up in one sentence Uh, because I think people who go into fitness and I am – no stranger to it myself and I'm the type who when I find something I love I become very obsessive about it so you know I got into lifting I haven't been in a gym for a long time because I was in Melbourne (laughs) and I got you know everything closed down I got out of the habit of it but you know I was um weightlifting so I have the body type that I can build muscle quite easily I'm very fortunate in in that respect however you know I'm 41 this coming year so when in my formative years the um the images were all that kind of heroin chic Kate Moss very you know girls with curves had not yet become <laughs> had not yet become the thing so I was always a bit self-conscious about it but these days you know strong women are being celebrated which is fantastic so I got stuck stuck into the weightlifting at the gym and loved it but it can, you can overdo it very easily. So <laughs> making sure that you're taking adequate rest days, making sure that you're not following 
crazy restrictive diets. Um, If you are going to eat more in a more restrictive fashion, I would highly recommend working with someone who understands nutrition Um, and giving yourself giving yourself enough time off. I think, again, if, if I had to give you one tip for the women who are right into their fitness and training, it's that you actually, you will get more gains by taking time off. And that, to, to speak about it from a Chinese medicine point of view, it's that balance between yin and yang. Mm. So people have seen the Tai Chi, the, it was a very popular tattoo in the 80s, <laughs> the yin and yang symbol of the black and the white. It sort of looks like fish swimming together and they've got the dot of the opposite color and that's the representation of yin and yang in the universe really so you have these two primary opposing forces opposites yin and yang but they're not complete opposites because they actually they need each other they nurture each other they oppose each other they transform into each other so you'll have if you look at it in terms of day and night day is yang and night is considered yin but what about dawn you know, what about evening? They're crossover times, aren't they? Where it's sort of not completely night, not completely day. Or you've got shadows occurring in daytime. You know, that's darkness within light. So yin and yang are constantly in flux and they're constantly balancing each other and supporting each other and opposing each other. So we can pretty much explain everything that's going on in the body in Chinese medicine in terms of that interplay between yin and yang. But if you look at it in terms of rest and activity, you know, when you're training, if you're training, training, training and never giving yourself time off, you're going to deplete that yin. And for women, that's pretty disastrous because we are yin, you know, yin, females pertain to yin, men pertain to yang. Blood is a yin substance, you know, and we're menstruating or we should be every month. So if you're sapping your yin with too much activity, too much yang, then that can manifest in hormonal problems and problems around the period. Mm. I love the fact that you mentioned about yin and yang because I'm very into like the woo and energetics and it like takes you back to the masculine and the feminine energies as well, similar to that. So, you know, as females, we live in such a masculine dominant world where we just burn out so quickly and, you know, this ties in really nicely into the fitness. Like you said, you need to do less to, to gain more but because we get fed to, you know, just work hard, do hard, like we can't cope with that mechanism, you know. Even in terms of training. So most of your listeners will be familiar with the circadian rhythm, you know, that there is, yep. Uh, but we actually as women have something called an infrantian rhythm, I think is the word, and that's that we are cyclical throughout the month. Yeah. So when you're, and it, there are a lot of your listeners who probably know this, so forgive me for going over it, but it's a really, really important point, and that is this idea of, I hate this word, by the way, but periodization yeah. of the training yeah like it makes me cringe but training around the period so uh, if you're tracking your progress there are times in your cycle where you are going to be more likely to hit a pb you know you're going to be more coordinated when you're pre-menstrual have you ever noticed how uncoordinated you get <laughs> yeah so that's the because of the different hormones throughout the different times of the cycle so if you're tracking your progress you need to track week one of this cycle to week one of next cycle not week two of the same cycle because of the hormonal fluctuations and you know if you're aiming for pbs and top performance do that around ovulation but be careful because you're more likely to injure yourself at that time and then you know you want to back down the intensity when you're coming up to being premenstrual and and getting your period because you just don't have the same energy levels at that at that point so uh yeah it's really important to train through the cycle yeah such a good point that you made i love that you cringe about the periodization word (laughs) you can't just put ization on the end of a word and make a new word (laughs) although apparently you can well they they did it they've done it now so they've made it officially um but i love the fact that you mentioned how you need to compare, let's say, week one to week one, not week one to week four. And I, I do that a lot with my clients, making them realize that you can't compare your period phase to your ovulation phase because they're two completely phases. So for our listeners, if you're like, oh, my God, I don't do this, it's just like, well, look back at what your cycle was like from day one to day seven and compare that to the second month after after that and seeing what, you know, what are some of the the changes that you're experiencing right now? I'm sure, Joanna, you see that with many of your clients. Well, I mean, 
I see with my clients that they have different challenges throughout the month. It's mainly a lot of the work that I do. So I do work with fertility, um, but also I love working with uh, clients who are dealing with endometriosis because there's so much that can be done for that condition, particularly acupuncture is really the jewel in the crown there, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, these these people, there are certain times of the month that's just a, it's just a, I was going to say a death sentence, that's a little bit traumatic, but, you know, they're, they're having to take time off work. This isn't just your stock standard period pain, pop an Advil and, you know, watch a movie and, and relax. It, it's, it's really crippling pain uh, that these people are suffering from and it affects their social life, their relationships, their work. Uh, so yes, and those symptoms are more prominent at different times of the cycle, obviously. Mm -hmm. I love that you mentioned about endo because that's a huge thing. Um, I don't know if it's a, a thing right now or just over the coming years, but more women are realizing that there's other alternatives to surgery from, you know, from what I'm, the research I'm reading from women that I'm speaking to that these days, again, like it's always going to be like a 50 50 if you get the the keyhole surgery it may work but it may not work where i believe that looking more into the natural way to prevent surgery i think that's probably like one of the best options in my eyes so the thing about endo is it's like rust right if you're cutting out rust you have to get every single every single particle otherwise it will come back and so when you're having a lap, you really need to be doing it with an advanced trained surgeon who knows what they're looking for because endo lesions can present quite different differently. You know, you can have red lesions, but you can also have white lesions. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you're under the care of an advanced trained surgeon is really, really important. And for some people, because a lot of, I think it's the average time to diagnosis for endometriosis is 12 years. Right. right. It's crazy. So what you're having is you're having young girls and this is an area that I'm very passionate about. So I, I will apologize in advance if I sound like I'm getting preachy or getting up on my soapbox. Uh, but you have young girls who are experiencing menstrual challenges, period pain, and they go to their mom and they say, this sucks. <laughs> and so their mom will take them to the doctor and through no fault of their own, the doctor really only has one option, okay. you know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> in there. And, in there. Yeah, yeah. So the doctor is not a bad person. I want to make that very clear. I'm not doctor bashing. GPs are amazing. You and I were talking a little uh, before we came on that I just recently had an operation on my ear and my brain. And that was something that was picked up by a GP. Um, and I'm, had he not picked it up, I would have more than likely wound up with meningitis at some point and could have died. Right. So GPs are, are not, I'm not bashing them. However, they don't have a lot of tools in their toolkit. So they will introduce some form of hormonal birth control. But all that does is it masks the symptoms. So if you have estrogen responsive endometriosis, then it is going to help because you're flatlining all the natural hormones and just replacing them with synthetic ones. But if you're using the pill or the ring or if you're using the hormonal IUD, that's a little bit different. Um, and for some people with really severe endo, that is actually an option. Uh, but to your point before about prevention being better than cure. So what's happening is the, the condition kind of keeps going in the background with no discussion about how it's an inflammatory condition. Uh, people with endo definitely shouldn't smoke. I think, you know, we can safely say in this day and age that smoking is not flash for anybody, but definitely for people who are suffering from endometriosis, you may want to look at some dietary changes. There is no one size fits all with diet, but experiment, take out grains, take out dairy, um, you know, find out, what diet might work for you, but that's not happening. You know, we're just shutting down the reproductive system before it's even started, you know, and then time will go on and you're at a point where really your only option is a surgical intervention. Mm -hmm. However, that's not necessarily the worst outcome because going in with someone who's trained to do a proper excision and get all the endo and then working with someone like yourself, like an acupuncturist, like a naturopath. There's plenty of different modalities that can help, but to figure out how do you stop the progression again? So endo is not curable. It is something that people who have it learned to live with, but we all learn to live with something. Yeah. And that's, you know, we were talking about that before, right? Everybody goes through something. And I think, 
that we're actually lucky, luckier to go through it early in our life because that shows us not to take our health for granted. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it teaches us from an early age. I feel like shit every day. I don't want to get out of bed. This is too hard. And so when you have good health, you celebrate it. You know, every day, I sound like an annoying person now, but every day I wake up and I'm like, right, I'm going to do my gratitude list. And I really can't get past simple things like I have arms, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, I'm grateful that I have arms. I'm grateful that I can breathe without inhibition. You know, we don't even, your next breath, you don't think about where it's coming from. You just take it, but it's not like that for everybody. So um, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there, but to bring it back to endometriosis, I think if you, if you have to have a surgery, that's actually, it, it kind of, um, and particularly in fertility, we sort of say it's like if you're going to plant a garden, you go in, spray it with Roundup or whatever, you, know, you pull out or slightly more natural, you pull out all the weeds, dig them in, mulch them in, you want to get everything. But if someone's been having a party in that field that you want to plant and there's broken bottles and cigarette butts and 44-gallon drums, you know, go in, get all that stuff out of there. And then we start to tend, tend the soil, tend the garden. And uh, a lap can actually do that, can get you playing off scratch again. Mm, I love that. Such a good um, explanation of that because, you know, from a young age, like I'm not an endo sufferer. I've had like symptoms of PCOS, but I do work with a lot of women who have endo and they've gone down that line of surgery and then they bounce back to straight to the pain that they had previously. So as you mentioned, it's like doing your research, getting maybe like a second opinion from another doctor and, you know, looking further into it instead of just going with one method. Because like you said, one method may work for some in, so for some people, but it may not work for the other individual. If someone is in the situation of needing to have a laparoscopy, I would encourage them to look for an advanced trained laparoscopic surgeon. So these people have to do uh, a certain number of procedures every year. They've got over a thousand hours or something clinical training. I can't remember the exact the exact number, but you want you want a specialist in that area. Mm, I love that. So good. And also taking um, note of what you mentioned about being gratitude. I know like it sounds really like cliche and annoying because these days everyone's just wanting to be fucking grateful for, you know, what they're doing. But like you said, at the end of the day, if you're not grateful for what you actually have, you may miss on it one day and not realize like all the good stuff that you have around um, around you, which I think is amazing amazing thing for us to just like sit back be present be like cool i can breathe cool i can move my legs you know like some people have it more you know more difficult than we do yeah and it it doesn't mean that your suffering and your trauma is not valid for you right so and and i I know that you're not suggesting that for a second but so there's a difference between pathological optimism oh i'm fine you know somebody has it worse than me uh and then not actually acknowledging that you're going through a shit time but i think it is um entirely possible for us to get bogged down with the minutiae of life and to forget that the fact that we are here the random chance of you being on this spinning rock in space hurtling around with other spinning rocks on this incredible planet what are the chances of that you know like this life is an incredible an incredible thing and it's precious and that's the gift of you know seeing from a young age chronic illness and and terminal illness and people who didn't get to one thing you, you heard me before tell people how, how old I am. I tell everyone how old I am. <laughs> I'm not one of these people who wants to hide my age I because love- it's yeah. a privilege to get old as far as I'm concerned. And if I see wrinkles on my face these days, I don't care, you know, because it just means I'm getting older. And I've said, having, to, having talked all about cosmetic acupuncture and <laughs> getting rid of fine lines and wrinkles, but, <laughs> you know, I see my wrinkles as just a sign that I got to live another day. So that's something that I think every, women and in particular women, but men too, but women should own their age, you know, and, and love the fact that every year that you get to stick around is another year of this fabulous thing that we call life. Mm, yeah. I love that you mentioned that because there's so many of us, like I think from when I was in my teenage years and I remember I, I think it was, that I was turning 20 or 21. I was just like, no, it's so old oh my God, I can't do that, you know, but now like, you know, in my mid thirties, I'm like, cool, like let, let's own it, you know, 
When I was 20, I thought 40 was done and finished right over the hill. And let me tell you, I am just getting started. And that's overwhelmingly what I hear from women who are entering their forties as well. As well, like, right, let is, let's get this show on the road. Let's get this party started. <laughs> but yeah, at 20, I just thought, oh, surely you'll just be living out the rest of your days in a rocking chair somewhere. <laughs> I love that. It just shows you like throughout your years and, you you know, your cycles, the cycles that you have within your cycles, you'll notice how you, um, what's the word I'm looking for, evolve, you know, like you may think as a teenager that the 40 is old, but by the time you've reached 30 or 40, you're like, holy shit, like my life is amazing, you know. So as you said, like you embrace it a little bit more as you get older. Yeah, the good thing about I think the age of 40 is you've kind of, let go of a lot of hang-ups, you give a lot less fucks. <laughs> that's, that's just for one. You give a lot less fucks. And your body is still um, it's still kind of in the prime of life. You're really strong. You may be starting to enter that perimenopausal phase depending on um, your propensity or genetic propensity for it. But, um, you know, things are still, your body's still strong. It's still really active and your your head's a little bit more together. You know, we, we're often plagued with a lot of insecurities and, and stuff in our younger years. So, and I think, you know, speaking again in terms of Chinese medicine, we talk about the, the phases of life and particularly through a, wom- a woman's life. And menopause is one that a lot of people dread, but in Chinese medicine, it's called the second spring. Mm. And in, I was reading Lara Bryden's uh hormone repair manual the other day and she talks about it as a second puberty which is very similar but yes in Chinese medicine it's long been referred to as the second spring because you start to emerge from underneath the what's the right word to use I was going to say underneath the rock of your hormones but that again a bit traumatic <laughs> uh, but the hormones that bind you to raising children and putting the family first and putting other people's needs ahead of your own they start to drop off So you kind of step back into your power as an individual and your life becomes a little bit more about you. Your children are more independent. They've grown up and moved away from you. And so you can really take back the reins of your own life, independent of other people's needs, which as uh, you know, if you, if you become a mother, other people's needs do become quite important for, for a little while there. So menopause is something I think that um, you know, people like Lara Bright and they're starting to change the conversation around it. And um, Dr. Christine Northrup as well, uh, that it's not something, yes, there are changes that will need to be managed, but it's not something to fear and dread. Mm-hmm. Apparently a lot of women see it as the loss of their significance, you know, that when they stop menstruating and they stop being, you know, young and vibrant and sexually attractive or perceive themselves sexually in a sexually attractive way, they just feel they become irrelevant. And I, f- I find that really tragic and sad. <laughs> yeah, well, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because like throughout my life I've been surrounded by women who say that once you reach, you know, perimenopause or menopause, that's it, like life is over. And they pictured this like horrible life to me. And I think that's probably why I was dreading becoming older because I, that's it. I'm going to lose that my sense of, you know, femininity and like my cycle and, you know, like my hormones are just going to go down. I'm just not going to love life. But like, it's not what it is. You know, it, it hits everyone differently. And again, those women were very unhealthy. So it makes complete sense why their lives were, you know, miserable. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a, uh, no guarantees in terms of your transition into menopause and how that will go for you. However, the, there is a suggestion that healthy, regular ovulation in your fertile years is kind of like putting deposits into the, the bank mm-hmm. for future health so that the more, uh, ex- it's the, the greater exposure to progesterone is what's seen as protective in the, in the menopausal years. And, you know, arguably women are, oh, I, I hope I don't offend anyone with this, but air quotes, we are designed to have eight or nine pregnancies like our grandmothers used to. I mean, contraception has been nothing short of revolutionary for women having that reproductive control. But if you look at it from a biological perspective, our bodies are designed to have much longer exposures to progesterone than we have in our modern world where we maybe only have one pregnancy or two pregnancies as opposed to you know, eight or nine. So that is making sure that you're having that healthy, regular ovulation so that you're getting that exposure to progesterone is uh, kind of 
some steps towards future proofing your menopause. And the other thing that modern life is kind of works against us women uh, biologically, and again, talking about what we were saying before about uh, times in your life and cycles and patterns around that time of a woman's life, 40, 50 years old, she should be able to take the foot off the accelerator a little bit. But in modern times, that's not happening. Most women are still working full time. Yeah. They have children who may be grown up, but still are relying on them in some ways. A lot of them are providing childcare. And whilst historically our elders would have been involved in childcare in like the village tribal scenario, they weren't holding down full-time jobs with asshole bosses, right? So, so they're, they're maybe looking after their grandkids and highly likely their parents' health is starting to fail as well. So they're looking after parents. So they are really running themselves into the ground and they're over committing their resources. And that's contributing to, um, a, you know, really negative experiences in menopause as well, because it's a time when we should be slowing down, yeah. but that's not, that's not being able to happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. So fascinating. And I love that you mentioned also Dr. Lara Biden, like both of her books are really cool, but that second one that she brought out, she talks more about um, perimenopause, doesn't she? Yeah. So the first one is a period repair manual and that's sort of more for young and menstruating women. And then the hormone repair manual is the second one. And that's for perimenopause and menopause and postmenopause. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. So, so fascinating. So good. Um, wow. We've covered so much today. I, I don't think there was anything else on my mind that I really wanted to discuss aside from like everything that we've literally covered. Like I feel as if our listeners are going to get so many takeaways or so many key points from what we've um, chat, um, today was there anything else you wanted to finish off with no I think we've done a really lovely general toe in the water over a few different topics and if uh if we we could come back at another time and dive a little bit deeper into any one of those topics whether it's you know period pain hormone imbalance uh urogenital issues we can we can maybe have a slightly more linear conversation (laughs) but today was really great I think just covering off some of the major issues that can certainly happen in a woman's life Mm, me too me too before we finish off um Joanna where can our listeners find you what platforms are you on right now yeah so again uh I had this surgery fairly recently so I've been really quiet online but I do have an Instagram account that if uh, people can scoot over have a look if you like what you see don't be discouraged by the fact that I haven't posted anything since October, Um, (laughs) then feel free to follow along there. What I would really love is if people are interested in um, some hormonal, hormonal health. I'm going to try that sentence again. If people are interested in learning about things they can do to support their hormonal health, that's better. Then they can go to my website and download. I have a free guide on there called 21 Steps to Pain-Free Periods. Mm -hmm. And that will pop them onto my mailing list, which uh, again, (laughs) has been very quiet, but something that hopefully in the new year, I'll be able to get into and just share some more information um, about all the stuff that we have been talking about today. So I'll let you link to those somehow in the show notes, whatever. I've had a habit of spelling my name out in full in the past and (laughs) podcast people being like, it's all right, love. I'll just put it in the show notes. <laughs> but on Instagram, I'm Joanna underscore MacMeekin. And uh, yeah, but if you can spell that, then you deserve a medal. <laughs> I'll let you link it below. I love it. Awesome. Well, girls, I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did and, you know, taking some few notes over there. If not, recall um, the podcast. Let us know how um, you found it. You know, recommend it to your girlfriends, screenshot it, tag us at the Women's Health, um, Women's Fitness Academy. And um, till next time, make sure that you are taking care of your health. And like Joanna said, your health is your greatest wealth.